Hi folks, my name is Ben Clausen, and I'm the SexNet Research Manager at CBRC. Uh, it's my pleasure today to get to moderate this investigators panel, um, and I'm very excited to be here uh, doing that today. Um, so I'm gonna keep my introduction brief, uh, as I do want to turn uh, the floor over to the investigators to share their amazing work uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, it'll be far more interesting than listening to me talk. Uh, before I do uh, pass it over to the investigators, however, I do want to acknowledge um, that CBRC's work extends across Turtle Island and that we acknowledge that we live and work on the traditional and unceded territories of Indigenous nations across what is uh, now commonly referred to as Canada. As an organization, we're committed to decolonization and reconciliation and acknowledging who this land belongs to uh, is a really uh, integral part of that process. Um, so the work that you will see presented today was done on the traditional and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples, uh, the Cree and Métis peoples, and the Wendat and Nashanabeg, Haudenosaunee, Métis, uh, and the Mississaugas of Credit First Nation. Just to provide you with a brief outline of uh, where this will go over the next hour or so, I will provide a very brief uh, overview of uh, the investigators program before turning it over to Bryn, Sammy, Rachel, and Shafir from the Edmonton investigators, uh, who are gonna talk about some of their qualitative work around how COVID-19 has fostered reflection around gender identity and expression uh, in Edmonton. I am very excited to hear about this. Um, I'll then pass it on to Brennan and Gavin from the Toronto investigators, uh, who will share some uh, really exciting analyses of SexNet 2018 data. Um, and then finally hand it over to Manish from the Vancouver investigators, who will talk a little bit about his analysis of SexNet 2019 data uh, and provide a little bit of an update around what the Vancouver investigators have been up to uh, over the last few months. So uh, for those of you who are not familiar with this program, uh, as I do realize that a lot of folks here uh, will be very aware of the investigators, um, this is a program for young, gay, bi, queer, trans, and two-spirit people, uh, where participants get to learn about queer health and community-based research uh, in Canada. They also get to learn, um, you know, hands-on experience with the research project, uh, and this often involves uh, participation in study design, recruitment, analysis, uh, and knowledge translation, uh, which would include, you know, sharing results at Summit, for example. Um, and this can also include experiences with qualitative, quantitative, or mixed methods research, as we'll see um, later on. Uh, the program was established in 2011 by Dr. Olivier Ferlat, uh, who still works very closely with us at CBRC. Uh, thank you, Olivier. Um, and we now have programs uh, in Vancouver, Edmonton, Winnipeg, Toronto, and Halifax, with another program coming very soon to Montreal, uh, which we're also very excited about. Um, and I think we uh, kind of collectively see this, uh, the investigators is really kind of at the core of what we do at CBRC, both in terms of building community capacity and ensuring that our research uh, is community led from start to finish. So this is a program that's really near and dear to a lot of us uh, at CBRC and affiliated with the CBRC, uh, which is why I'm so excited to be a part of this panel today. Um, so through the program, investigators, uh, as I mentioned, learn some employable research skills, but they also get to connect um, with peers and with mentors uh, who might be experts uh, in their various fields, for example. Uh, and CBRC and our partners, uh, organizational partners, get to learn a lot about the experiences of young queer people and get to engage meaningfully with those experiences. Um, and we also get to increase community capacity um, and diversify our research teams ultimately um, because a lot of folks that have been part of the investigators program have gone on to be mainstays uh, in the sector in terms of uh, you know, continuing to be researchers and involved in community-based research um, in, in queer health, which is very exciting. And I think a testament to the strength, strength of this program. So in talking about how this program works, I think we kind of have to talk a little bit about how COVID has impacted the way the program functions. So prior to COVID, um, most workshops and boot camps and reading groups, all of these activities were held in person. 
um, in, in their respective cities. And since the start of the pandemic, um, all of these programs have had the transition to meeting online. Um, and I'm sure the folks that have been coordinating these programs um, can speak to, uh, you know, the precise challenges uh, that that involved. Um, but I mean, uh, Zoom is a very different way of engaging with each other than, uh, you know, being able to meet in person and share some food together, which is the way, um, you know, the program has tended to work in the past. So there's less opportunities to socialize, perhaps, which is often a big part of what the program is all about. Um, but I also think that there are, um, have been some really interesting opportunities that have arisen through this um, shift to meeting online uh, and, and through Zoom. Uh, and the example of the Edmonton investigators um, expanding to have an Alberta-wide cohort uh, this last year uh, is a really great example of some of the opportunities presented um, by this, uh, you know, necessary shift to meeting online. And throughout this, we've still managed to, uh, you know, engage extensively with mentors and experts uh, in uh, their respective fields and bring them in to Zoom sessions uh, to, you know, build research skills and capacity uh, for folks in this program. So I think that's all I'm going to say about investigators. Um, and I'll just turn it over to the Edmonton investigators. All right, uh, good afternoon. We'll start by introducing our team. So hi, my name is Bryn. Hi, my name's Rachel. My name is Sammy. And I'm Shafir. And we're the group of four community-based researchers that embarked on a qualitative research project through the Edmonton Investigators Program that we're calling Reflections on Gender Identity and Expression During the COVID-19 Pandemic. Next slide. So we'll start by just giving you a little bit of background and methods for our research. Our research question is how have circumstances related to the pandemic fostered reflection on gender identity and expression within the 2S LGBTQIA community? So this research question emerged through our shared experiences and we see this as a real highlight of the community-based aspect of the work. A few of us had anecdotally noticed this phenomenon in our own communities where folks were reflecting in new ways about their gender identity since the start of the pandemic. And then looking at the existing literature, there was really nothing on this topic. And although some limited research has started to appear looking at gender in the pandemic, it revolves around gender norms and roles and not gender identity or the queer and trans communities. So it was a clear gap in the literature and presented a timely and we believe important line of inquiry. As for our methods, we'll start by chatting about recruitment. So our selection criteria for interview participants had four components. The first was to be 18 years of age or older. The second, they had to reside in Canada. Thirdly, participants needed to identify as a member of the 2S LGBTQIA community. And lastly, they had to have thought deeply or in a new way about their gender identity or expression during the pandemic. And we recruited specifically through social media. Given the small scale of the project, we knew we only had so much capacity for doing interviews. So we decided to start recruitment simply through our own personal social media. Our team members shared the research poster and it got reshared by a couple of community-based organizations. Our interview slots filled up in under two days, so we had quite the response. So we didn't pursue further recruitment efforts past that. As for our ethics process, because we're not affiliated with an institution, we did not have access to a research ethics board. In light of the community-based na nature of our research, we saw community oversight, and we did this by having our research proposal and our materials reviewed by the research subcommittee of the Edmonton Men's Health Collective's Board of Directors. For our study, we conducted 10 semi-structured interviews, which ranged in length from 20 to 60 minutes. They were all conducted over Zoom, and each of our team members did one to three interviews. And although we did conduct 10 interviews. This is an ongoing research project and we're still in the midst of data analysis. So the presentation for you here today is based on the initial five interviews. 
As for data analysis, our process involves coding and theming our interview transcripts. And more specifically, we began by doing the initial coding of one another's transcripts. And we're currently in the process of collaboratively building a codebook and finding emerging themes through that process. As a group of four community-based researchers and one community research project coordinator, we worked as a non-hierarchical team. And we wanted to highlight some of the principles and processes for you behind this method. The first is being relational. We spent time building relationships and learning alongside one another before choosing our research question. The project has intentionally rested on our relationships with one another, as well as with the queer community. Uh, from choosing, our, uh, choosing and refining our research question to picking methods for data analysis, all of our decisions were made collectively through discussion and consensus. Next is debriefing. A strength of our group method has been the ability to debrief through our learning process and throughout our data collection phase. The mutual support and reflexivity of this has strengthened our research. And lastly, we have drawn on each other's strengths throughout this process to improve the quality of our research, improve the impact on our participants, and to build research capacity of our team. Wonderful. So as Bryn mentioned, we were able to very quickly recruit 10 participants and we're partway through our data analysis. So, so far we've been able to look at interviews from five of our participants. And what's really amazing is that with e even within these five individuals, we've already been able to capture a really broad cross section of the queer community with our participants showing a really broad range, not only in terms of identities and backgrounds, but also in terms of their experiences and responses uh, with this project and we'll share a little bit of our findings uh, quite soon. <clears throat> and so in terms of some of the demographics of the folks that we've talked to, their, their ages have ranged from 19 years of age to 50, so quite a broad in, age range there. Also in terms of identities, <clears throat> we've chatted with folks from a multiple uh, range of gender identities and expressions. So our participants have self-identified as being trans, non-binary and or queer as an example. And in terms of location, so far all of our participants have been located either in Alberta or British Columbia and have been centered in primarily an urban context in terms of where they live. <clears throat> so uh, again, as Bryn mentioned, we had a really uh, quick response. So in less than two days, we had 10 interviewees plus a waiting list, which was very heartening. And when initially connecting with these individuals, we found there were a broad range of interests in terms of why they wanted to engage with this research. So one common thread was that there was a great interest in this question we were asking. And again, because these folks were also noticing within their own circles and beyond that this uh, process of reflection during the pandemic on gender identity and expression was something that was taking place. Many of our participants also indicated that this interview provided them with a good uh, opportunity to further engage and process these reflections. And then finally, there seemed to be a lot of excitement in terms of contributing to queer scholarship itself and helping to fill these gaps in knowledge that we're seeing within our own community. So in terms of what we asked to address this question of how the circumstances around the pandemic were relating to the process of reflection around gender identity and expression, we really built our um, interview guide to capture three main concepts. So the first concept was this idea of the specific circumstances. So how has life changed for you during the pandemic? Second, we wanted to capture how or what the process of this, these reflections were looking like and how this reflection was happening. So in what ways have you been thinking about your gender identity or expression during the pandemic? And then finally, we wanted to make the connection between the two. So why do you believe these thoughts and reflections were coming up for you during the pandemic? And while we left our interview guides fairly flexible to allow the conversations to build organically, we let these three concepts really help guide our interviews. Okay, so we'd like to turn now to our preliminary findings. And next slide, please. We determined that there were a few main circumstances participants experienced during the pandemic, and these include increased feelings of isolation and disconnection from social activities, community and support systems, increased connection that occurred as a result of social activities and other supports shifted to online formats. Some participants felt that they had more time due in some cases to school and employment circumstances changing. 
Participants also shared experiences accessing mental health supports, often communicating mental health challenges or challenges dealing with mental illness. Uh, participants had varied experiences accessing healthcare supports and services and engaging in medical processes. In some ways, the pandemic set up barriers to accessing healthcare services um, as clinics and other healthcare providers shifted to online formats. And in some ways, the pandemic facilitated access to healthcare services and that online formats were much easier to access. Um, as a related offshoot to these findings, some participants also reported undergoing the process of medical transitioning during the pandemic. Um, and here's a quote pulled from one of our transcripts that speaks to the points I've just mentioned. Even the sheer fact of not seeing as many people as often, right? If Monday night I decide to paint my nails, I don't need to take it off Tuesday morning to go to work. My cats don't care about my gender. And next slide, perfect. Another theme or concept gleaned from our interviews was reflection. We found that participants were engaging in reflexive practices about their gender identity and or expression. Participants experienced a shifting or reordering of priorities in life as they began, in some cases, to more fully enter deeper introspection. They began considering death and mortality more directly in relation to their lives through the same reflection. They felt deeper, sustained reflections engaging with aspects of their gender identity and or expression they had not previously engaged with. And some participants reported a range of feelings from exploration and uncertainty to increased self-respect and self-worth also experienced in general introspection and deeper connections with friends and community developed by utilizing online resources such as TikTok and Jira Reboot. As one participant explained, I was just trying to distant, distract myself with as much stuff as I could cram into my schedule and be as involved as possible. And when you start to strip those things away, you really have to reflect in some way or another. There's just too many hours a day, I think, to not go through some form of introspection. And next slide, please. Perfect. Connecting back to our research inquiry, we found that the pandemic and pandemic circumstances acted as a facilitator for deepening pre-existing reflections on gender identity and or expression. Participants communicated experiencing particular identity changes, including more assertiveness in, in expressing their gender identity and experimenting with forms of gender identity and expression. And we found that circumstances also developed into a powerful tool for, for self-conceptualization and reaffirmation. Moving beyond the pandemic, we found that the pandemic circumstances themselves inspired deeper forms of reflection in regards to gender identity and expression that continue to take place now and in the future for participants. This is to say that such circumstances continue to produce lifelong and impactful effects upon our participants. As this participant mentioned, it is kind of validating and seeing other people talk about it. It wasn't just me going through this weird mental situation. It was a conversation that society should be having more. It lit a fire under my wanting to lean the hell into my queerness. Perfect, okay. So I'll be talking about where our project is heading and the impact it's had on community members and participants, as well as possibilities for further study. Um, so, with next steps, um, as we said before, these are pre our preliminary findings. And so we're gonna continue analysis and finish coding and, and extracting themes. Once we've completed uh, our analysis, we'll hold a community event to present our findings. And we'll share those themes and learnings with the community in an online format, and also invite community members to share, uh, to hold space, share poetry, music, or art, um, and just engage with us um, collaboratively. Uh, after a community event, we want to represent our findings in a tangible and accessible format online. Um, this could, we haven't exactly, since we haven't finished uh, the analysis, we want to decide on the format once that's complete. We were thinking it's possible we might use a zine or uh, social media infographics, but it's important to us that we're able to convey this back to the community and, uh, and give back in a way that we've been given. Um, there was a few key learnings and, uh, and areas for further study that became uh, quite apparent while we were doing our, our interviews and analyzing them. We found that the study provides a, a good glimpse into the everyday lives of members of the 2S LGBTQIA community during the pandemic. Um, some challenges that the community are facing became really apparent, as well as some of the resiliencies the community holds. Um, this idea of a supportive environment to support uh, introspection and reflection on gender identity and expression became very important. 
Um, and there was a few ways that came up uh, for how to actually create an environment where that reflection and introspection can happen. Um, a few of those key elements uh, for that supportive environment are having a, a, an atmosphere of tolerance and non-judgment from allies, having representation of the community folk, uh, members, the members of the 2S LGBTQIA plus community in the actual population, and also reduced pressure to behave or express oneself in binary or gendered ways. Further study into this supportive environment and ways it can be applied in various caregiving, clinical, or other settings can support policy, decision-making, and social structures that can empower members of the community to discover, be, and express themselves authentically. Our research also highlighted the importance of representation in media as supporting the process of reflection. Something else that came up was this, um, this range of ways that queer people can access services. Um, our research showed that, that some folks uh, really were doing well with telehealth and other online um, methods of service delivery, while other folks had increased barriers set up through, through, those, um, through those methods. And this is value, valuable because um, it sort of shows ways that uh, the community can be supported during and, and past the pandemic and, and challenges that have come up as well. Finally, this product, uh, project provides a bit of a model for remote collaboration and successes when conducting community-based research. Despite having never met in person, each of us have been able to build relationships with each other, and uh, that is, that's allowed us to, to work together intentionally, supportively, and effectively. Finally, I'll touch on the impact on participants. Um, as was mentioned before, participants came into this uh, interview wanting to share their ideas, their their feelings and actions and consolidate that in one place. Um, and that kind of contributed to this empowering reflection process uh, and something that was very affirming and validating as well. Um, I'll finish by reading a quote by one of our participants. Even the fact that there's a study on this exact topic right now was like super validating to be, oh, this is a topic of interest, which means that there's a pool of people that this is happening to. That means that I'm not alone. Thanks for listening to us. Um, we're really excited to be here. If you, like we said, this is a, a work in progress. So we still have to finish analyzing our, our uh, project and sharing our findings. Um, but when we do finish, uh, you, we, we'd encourage you to stay in touch. You can email our program coordinator, Finn, at healarhealthyeg.ca or look for our findings online at investigators.ca slash Edmonton. Thank you. Thanks so much, Bryn, Sammy, Rachel, and Shafir. Uh, I think that's just, uh, you know, wonderful work. So cool to see a project that was conceptualized with in investigators from start to finish uh, and such a meaningful research question. Um, so for folks who might have joined recently, uh, just want to give you a reminder to please uh, type in your questions into the chat. Um, and we'll get to those at the end once all of our investigators presenters have had a chance to share their really wonderful analyses. Um, so up next, uh, we have Gavin and Brennan from the Toronto Investigators, who will both be sharing um, some results uh, from uh, analyses of Sex Now 2018 data. Hi there, my name is Gavin Bajimo, and I am the Gay Men's Sexual Health and Harm Reduction Coordinator at ACT, and I'm super excited to be presenting this information with you on behalf of the Investigators, where I got the opportunity to explore community satisfaction amongst guys who party and play. So let's talk a little bit about the history and the relationship that substance use has had with queer men. Um, in the recent history, it was criminalized to be gay. And so a lot of gay men had to find unique and innovative ways to connect, whether it be through cruising or in bars or bathhouses. And so a lot of these spaces were often not sober. And we see uh, even now that there aren't um, a lot of sober spaces, even while uh, it's been decriminalized to be gay. We also have new technologies to connect online, and yet the relationship that queer men have to substances continues to endure, and substances continue to be relevant in the lives of queer, men's, uh, queer men. And so this is because of uh, the fact that substances opens a, a doorway to pleasure, um, coping with trauma, uh, self-expression, and it can also help support queer men. Um, and so what is Party and Play? Party and Play is a specific set of uh, queer men who engage in substance use in the context of sex, and it usually involves a specific set of substances like crystal meth and GHB. So why do gay men party and play? It's 
for similar reasons why all gay men engage in substances, but it's to elevate the experience of sensation from sex. And it's also to allow for kinkier play that wouldn't otherwise happen sober. Um, PNP, uh, guys who PNP uh, can also report um, greater senses of community and connection. Some possible drawbacks to PNP are worth noting that sometimes those connections are superfluous and maybe only lasting for a moment and not thereafter when things are sober. And there can be consequences to other aspects of life, uh, such as health and having sober sex. So um, do my question was, do gay guys who engage in party and play or chem sex feel more satisfied with community than guys who do not? And I did this through uh, a chi-square analysis in R and we identified party substances that's not just crystal meth and GHP, but we also included substances that were are often mixed or used in um, uh, party play scenes, such as cocaine, ketamine, MDMA, erectile drugs, and poppers. People were asked if they had used particular substances in the last six months. So if they had used substances prior to that, they weren't included in the survey. So this is our results. Um, in this graph, we can see on the y-axis community satisfaction. On the x-axis, we have uh, the variables that we explored. The little asterisk represents a significant relationship. Uh, orange represents yes, blue represents no. Um, we see that for those uh, people engaging um, in any substances, uh, there was no significant difference in satisfaction amongst those who don't engage in substances at all. However, we wanted to narrow that down and rule out substances like alcohol, weed, and opioids uh, to our party substances. And we found that there was a significant difference in community satisfaction amongst those who engage in party substances than compared to those who use substances but don't use uh, party substances. And that difference was about 7%. Then we looked at sexual activity because we know chem sex is involving sex uh, and using substances at the same time. And so uh, sexually active uh, guys who um, had his partner in the last year, um, at least one, they um, uh, reported a higher sense of satisfaction than those who uh, were uh, not sexually active. Now we looked into that sexually active population and we looked at the variable of um, uh, party substances. And that we found uh, a greater sense of satisfaction amongst those who used party substances and were sexually active than um, amongst those who were sexually active but not using party substances. And that difference was also around 7%. Now we zoned in and we looked at um, amongst those who were using party substances and were sexually active, um, what about those who were doing party substances while having sex, so therefore engaging in chem sex or party and play? And we found that that community satisfaction was high at 64.7%, and uh, it was significantly higher than the satisfaction of those who were engaging in partying uh, party substances and or were having sex, but not doing them at the same time. And this indicates that the act of chem sex actually uh, uh, might lead to a greater community satisfaction or that there's a relationship there at least. So um, this has various implications. Uh, it suggests that there is this invisible population amongst those who use substances that are actually coping quite well. And maybe it's because of this sense of community that uh, guys who use party substances have. Um, so community is this protective factor for individuals from the adverse uh, effects of maybe using substances. Um, we also had uh, this um, other implication or uh, exploration that there's perhaps a greater sense of satisfaction in a context like Pride, where people are reporting their satisfaction in the middle of a party. Um, people may be using substances before answering the survey or using substances after. And so they're more likely to report a greater community satisfaction in a party setting. So also community satisfaction may differ between those who are actively using versus those who had historically used. This, um, we didn't explore uh, guys using substances before um, uh, uh, six months. And so that might also uh, shape the, the results. All this kind of implicates to me that um, queerness is a political identity that creates group cohesion, but maybe PNP and identifying as a part of the PNP community may also create group cohesion for similar reasons. Um, you know, we've seen that in being gay, that there's solidarity between queers living in a world that is heteronormative. Um, there's also solidarity amongst queer guys in the PNP scene um, using substances in a world that is drug prohibitive. Um, and uh, queer communities have often internalize stigma and revitalize it into positive expressions. And so maybe that's also happening in PNP communities where PNP serves to destigmatize experiences of substance use for the broader community and connect to all of us with our deeper desire for connection with each other and with our broader communities. So 
Um, I think that's all for me, and I'm looking forward to some questions. Thank you. Hi, my name is Brennan Snow, and I was a part of the third cohort of the Toronto Investigators. And we did some analysis of the 2018 uh, in-person Sex Now survey. Um, and I looked in particular at STI testing in trans participants. So my research question was, did trans participants get tested for STIs as recently as cisgender participants? And this is something I wanted to explore because of my own experiences as a trans person accessing healthcare. Um, I know that sometimes there can be um, a lot of sort of points of contact. So you might be talking to a receptionist and then a doctor and then a nurse. Um, and kind of at all of those points, there's potential if you don't have uh, your name changed legally or gender marker change, there's potential for being misgendered. Um, there's potential for confusion about name, pronouns, bodies, what kind of tests are being ordered. Um, and oftentimes the onus kind of falls on uh, the trans person to have to um, talk about that or to educate, educate their healthcare provider, um, which isn't super ideal in a patient relationship always. Um, and so my experiences um, seem pretty consistent with um, some of the literature that I was looking at. So trans people are more likely to experience barriers in accessing healthcare, um, with some people even avoiding emergency department visits. So if people are avoiding healthcare in emergencies, um, you can only imagine um, healthcare avoidance in terms of um, avoiding routine care, or in the case of STI testing, preventative care. Um, and in terms of uh, STI testing in particular, uh, and amongst trans men who have sex with men, uh, people have reported issues such as uh, their healthcare providers giving misinformation about risk for STIs, uh, lack of competency in trans healthcare in general, being misgendered or called by the wrong name, or even being refused care. And this was true also of clinics that cater towards the gay community as well. And so some of these past experiences can inform um, some anticipated stigma kind of leading to that healthcare avoidance possibly. So I looked at two variables um, in particular from the um, Sex Now survey. And the first was the question, do you have trans experience? So this was a yes or no question. Um, and interestingly, of those who had said yes, about 70% listed their gender identity as man. Um, and the other 30%, uh, it was a write-in variable. So uh, responses in the other category could have been something like transmasculine or FTM or most commonly non-binary, uh, potentially genderqueer, um, things like that. So this was actually something I didn't have access to that write-in variable, but uh, the CBRC just released a report a couple of months ago, a community profile that kind of outlined some of that, some of that answer. Um, and the other variable I looked at was the question, when were you last tested for STIs? So I split that into two categories to, just to do a fairly simple analysis. So I looked at people who had been tested within the last year and people who said they'd been tested longer than a year ago, never didn't know or kind of couldn't remember. Um, and so as you can see, uh, cisgender participants, 71.7% uh, had been tested, said they'd been tested in the last year compared to 65.2% of transgender participants. I did a chi-square test and the p-value was less than 0 0.05. Um, and so, um, yeah, and so I looked at, think, kind of thinking about that, I looked at a couple of other questions on the Sex Now survey. Um, so cis respondents were also significantly more likely to report not having delayed or skipped testing in the last year. Um, and when I was kind of thinking through reasons why that might be and reasons why um, trans people um, might have been less likely to get tested in the last year. Um, I also looked at another question and found that trans respondents were over three times more likely to report having delayed or skipped testing in the past year uh, due to lack of professional sensitivity to gay, bi, or queer men's health, which was one of the sort of checkbox reasons uh, that people could give. And so the way I kind of interpret that, and, or maybe the way that respondents might have been interpreting, interpreting that um, might have been an issue with transphobia or lack of professional sensitivity to um, trans health um, in particular. So yeah, in conclusion, um, I think it's really important to have, um, to kind of capture those lived experiences, whether through quantitative data or 
um, through talking to people and, and qualitative data um, about their experiences accessing healthcare in general and accessing STI testing. Because um, STI testing isn't something that's super fun for anybody. Um, and I think especially for trans folks might be especially sensitive. Um, and so I think steps need to be taken uh, to ensure clinic healthcare provider competency in trans health and kind of a, an eye towards streamlining those systems and making it harder for people to, um, to mess up. So uh, it's great if clinics list a preferred name spot or preferred pronouns, um, but in practice, if people aren't looking at that or uh, if they're not actually using that and people are still getting misgendered or misnamed, um, that can really create a not great environment for folks and can, and can make it harder for people to access these testing services. Um, so yeah, thank you. Thanks, Gavin and Brennan. Uh, those are both uh, really excellent analyses. Uh, Gavin, I think it's uh, you know really important reminder that we need to be careful, careful about the way that we talk about and view substance use uh, which is often through a stigmatized lens still. Um, and, uh, and Brennan, uh, I think like you highlight some really important uh, key service gaps with really clear implications for how we can improve testing services for trans folks uh, in our communities. Um, uh, very exciting work. And I just want to remind folks to uh, please, uh, you know, enter any comments that you have on these presentations and we'll get to them um, after Manish's uh, last presentation here. So yeah, I will just turn it over to Manish, who will be presenting some uh, an analysis of SexCon 2019 data. All right, so let me just get started quickly. Perfect, so, oops, okay. Uh, let me just go back. Okay, there we go. So hi everyone, my name is Manish. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time uh, to join me today. Uh, I've been a member of the Vancouver Investigators for about a year and a half now, and today I'll be talking a bit about my project um, that I've been working on over the past few months related to the experiences of GBTQ plus newcomers to Canada, and specifically their experiences accessing STI testing services. Right, so immigration is a process of constant transition. Changes in social ties and networks, transitioning from one culture to another, and for newcomers navigating a new and unfamiliar healthcare system. Yeah, much of the <laughs> current body of evidence surrounding newcomers' experiences in accessing healthcare centers on primary care or mental health services. This research points to a number of barriers and challenges faced by newcomers namely linguistic barriers, financial constraints, complex, complex health insurance rules, as well as social exclusion. Um, there are gaps in literature in examining the experiences of newcomers in accessing sexual health uh, services, as well as the experiences of GBTQ plus newcomers. Anecdotally, um, I've talked to a number of newcomers who have faced similar barriers to accessing sexual health services. Um, so I sought to answer the following question. How do GBTQ plus newcomers experience accessing STI testing services in comparison to established GBTQ plus residents? So to answer my question, um, I did descriptive stats calculated from a cross-sectional sample of GBTQ plus newcomers and established residents from the 2019 SexNow survey. Um, individuals were deemed as newcomers if they were landed permanent residents uh, who had settled in in the five years prior to the survey administration. Uh, in terms of statistical analysis, this was completed uh, using RStudio, using the dplyr and FD packages. So in terms of our approach at the Vancouver Investigators, uh, we learned R through a collaborative approach over the course of the summer. Uh, we had workshops from community researchers that supplemented and guided our learning. And so we were able to gain tangible statistical analysis skills through working with sex now survey data. And we developed our focus uh, for our individual analyses based on personal interest. Um, as a quick aside, um, many of my peers have presented their analyses as posters. So I highly encourage you guys to take a look at those as well. So what did we find? 
Starting off with behaviors surrounding accessing STI testing, around three quarters of GBTQ plus newcomers reported accessing um, testing services in the last 12 months, which makes them more likely to do so than established GBTQ plus residents. The most common locations of testing uh, were at their family physician's office, specialized sexual health clinics, and clinics specifically serving GBTQ plus men. So the following figure is a figure of odds ratios of the usual testing locations for newcomers compared to established residents. Um, solid dots indicate the calculated odds ratios and the horizontal lines indicate 95% confidence intervals. So the vertical line at one is especially important since overlap between the confidence interval and that line would suggest that um, no significant differences um, were observed between the populations. So here the data shows that uh, compared to established GBT Q plus residents, newcomers were less likely to access testing at family physicians' offices, but were more likely to do so at clinics specifically targeted to GBTQ plus individuals. No significant differences were found for specialized sexual health clinics. Looking a bit more into the experiences of newcomers in accessing STI testing services, we found that newcomers were more likely to be interested in seeking out these services compared to established residents. However, they were less confident in their ability to do so. Um, despite this, newcomers were more likely to ultimately access these services. So in terms of barriers and specifically factors that contributed to delayed or skipped testings, the most common responses among newcomers were, they, were that they were either too busy, that the hours were inconvenient, or that the wait times were deterrent. Compared to more established residents, there were no significant differences for most of these factors. Needs. So one notable difference was with cost. Um, and so newcomers were around four times more likely than established residents to report cost as being a barrier to STI testing. So what can we take away from this analysis? Um, well, we have a few main findings. The first of which is typically GBTQ plus newcomers are more likely to both be interested in and ultimately access STI testing services. Um, common locations for this include the family physician's office, as well as, notable, uh, as well as notably clinics targeted to GBTQ plus men in particular, which they are more likely to access relative to established residents. Uh, moreover, another main finding is that newcomers may feel less confident in being able to access testing services. And we also found that there are a number of barriers to accessing STI testing services uh, with costs disproportionately affecting newcomers. So why might this be the case? Well, uh, typically STI screening is covered by provincial health insurance plans and many clinics offer free uh, services for individuals who may not otherwise be covered. And so cost being a barrier may be suggestive of a lack of familiarity with the Canadian healthcare system and the rights to access under provincial insurance plans. Both these two factors have previously been established um, as a barrier to quality health care for newcomers to Canada. Moreover, another potential um, contributing factor may be a delay in coverage from arrival date. And so, for instance, in BC and Ontario, it takes about three months to be covered um, starting at the arrival date, and that's assuming that uh, individuals do apply right away. Whereas in other provinces like Alberta, coverage starts upon arrival. So moving on to some strengths and limitations of our approach. Uh, strengths include using a broad data set with a large sample size. The nature of the data set itself allows for pre-specified subgroup analyses. Uh, moreover, we use the community-based approach in informing the research question, and this also had the benefit of building research capacity and skills. Um, however, there were a few um, limitations due the, to the nature of our study. So since we used a prospective quantitative methodology, it limited our ability to explore the context and contributing factors to the findings. Um, moreover, the survey design limited our ability to discover findings unanticipated by the survey questions. So what's next and how can we put this knowledge into action? In terms of future work, a qualitative study looking at the experiences of GPTQ plus newcomers accessing STI services, or even more broadly, accessing uh, general health services would certainly be interesting. It may help elucidate some of the contributing factors to the results we've found so far, while capturing findings that may still be unanticipated. 
Moreover, a scan of facilitators for quality healthcare for newcomers, as well as gaps in current services would help inform potential interventions. In terms of the knowledge uh, mobilization based on what we know so far, community-based interventions can include providing immigrant service centers with resources about STI testing options, as well as supports for newcomers at STI testing locations. Clinics serving GBTQ plus newcomers may be a suitable target as newcomers are more likely to access testing at these locations. Um, so that wraps up my presentation. I just wanted to take a moment to thank um, those who have supported this work. So of course, this has been supported by the Community-Based Research Center. And I gratefully acknowledge uh, Dr. Lachowski, Jeffrey Morgan, Ben Kostin, Jonah Alk, Aiden, Aplona, Kiffer Card for their feedback and analysis, as well as Jeff, Ben, and Jonah for their continued guidance, support, and organization. So I think I'll turn it over for questions now. Thanks, Manish. Yeah, uh, just another really wonderful and important analysis highlighting uh, really key service gaps within our communities. Um, so yeah, I think we can move into the question period now. We have about 15 minutes. Um, so uh, I encourage folks to type their questions into the chat. Um, we have received a couple of questions already. Um, so this is kind of a question for the Edmonton investigators. Um, but Matteo uh, is reflecting, I wonder if the trans community was set up to optimize connection over the, the internet already. Uh, I'm not as active online lately, but I remember 15 years ago when I was first coming out, a lot of the only options for trans, trans connection were online. Um, so just wondering if that might uh, raise any reflections uh, for the Edmonton investigators folks. Uh, one of my fellow team members, feel free to jump in. I'm not sure if we have heard that uh, specifically, but definitely we heard sort of more generally a little bit about folks. I think the one I'm thinking of specifically, a participant was talking about being non-binary and the skills that they've um, had to accumulate around self-advocacy and flexibility and not serving them well during the pandemic. Um, one of uh, the participants I'd interviewed also, they'd said that uh, they were non-binary and identified as trans and, um, and they had said that uh, um, they'd found that some sort of uh, discussions with their, their friends and family were much easier to do online and that there were aspects of connection that really worked for them there um, that wouldn't have been so easy in person. Great, thanks so much for those reflections. Um, this question is uh, uh, for Gavin. Uh, again, this is from Matteo. Uh, Matteo's just uh, pointing out that there's also a huge connection between relational trauma and substance dependence versus those uh, of us who can use uh, and walk away uh, from using substances more easily. Uh, so Gavin, just wondering if you have any uh, you know, thoughts around that distinction. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of different experiences of substance use between different communities and certain communities have, uh, or certain individuals have different resiliences around whether or not that substance use becomes problematic for them. Um, and so, of course, relation of relationship trauma or some levels of trauma um, and uh, or experiences of discrimination or uh, severe isolation. Um, you know, there's many layers of things that I think are is absolutely worth uh, exploring more within a research context. Um, but also, it's just anecdotally uh, uh, something that I see in my work, but I also, um, you know, there's, uh, uh, and there's also often comparisons even between folk who um, may look to other peers who are able to, you know, manage their use in their lives and feel challenged by the fact that they're maybe not able to. Um, and so uh, because of these various uh, social determinants of health that, that, that lead into that and are or lead to experiences of trauma. Yeah, thanks so much, Gavin. Um, this is a question just for, for everyone, really. I think you've done a really great job of outlining uh, the implications of your research, of these analyses. Uh, but just curious to hear if you have any other thoughts around you know, how we can implement these findings through programming and, our, and through policy, maybe. 
Uh, you know, a lot of us are from uh, queer organizations, and I think a lot of what you have found here in these analyses uh, is really crucial for us to implement. So just curious to hear any thoughts from any folks on this panel around how we can better be taking up uh, these findings in our, in our uh, applied work. Um, I can speak on behalf of my presentation. Um, I mean, for me, I think you, when you summarized what, like, how it was like to, like, watch the presentation, it was the element of destigmatizing our work. I think so much of our work in working with guys who party and play or uh, is, is seen through a lens of our own experiences or lack thereof in terms of uh, what um, it's like to have that experience. Um, and uh, we see there's so much stigma around and drug hierarchies. Um, you know, we live in a, a culture that um, where alcohol is legal and weed is now legal, but still uh, we don't look at that. Um, uh, we, and we make excuses for that, those behaviors engaging alcohol, but less, uh, we're less understanding for guys who have uh, used different substances. So that lens can really, really be challenging for us to meet people where they're at and to connect with people on their on their level. And so, um, you know, there's so many ways within a harm reduction context to investigate how uh, um, someone's PNP experience can be safer or, or, uh, or, or uh, you know, prevention strategies can be utilized, you know, like using unused supplies or, um, you know, taking your favorite prevention strategies uh, into account before you use uh, so that you're able to, um, uh, you know, utilize those strategies in uh, play settings. And so um, there, it's about meeting people where they're at and it's about using that uh, and, and uh, using a destigmatized lens to do that. Great, yeah, thank you, Gavin. Um, I mean, any other thoughts around that question? How we can actually, you know, put these findings into practice within, you know, our organizational practices within our queer communities? Um, yeah, that like, makes me think a, a little bit about like, I think destigmatization and uh, representation uh, of, of, uh, of the community in, uh, in public spaces is, is something that I would also say is, is a, a key finding from our, a preliminary finding from our research. Um, one participant's quote kind of stands out to me. They said, I really miss university classes like in person because um, you can kind of express yourself however you want, like um, in this particular setting for them. They said that like, you know, on my left might be sitting like someone at 9 a.m. in like a full suit. Uh, and, and on my right might be someone sitting in their pajamas eating cereal straight out of the bowl, you know? Like, um, and, and so what like, and a few other participants echoed that sentiment of, uh, you know, when I'm in spaces where people are really expressing themselves really authentically and genuinely and they don't, um, they feel free to do so, then I'm also able to, to do so. And, and the pressure to um, present a certain way is reduced, which lets me really think, how do I wanna be actually? And how do I wanna live as opposed to, what do I wanna look like to other people? Yeah, I think that's such an interesting point because when I, when I kind of think about, and when I look at the, the literature out there um, around you know, how COVID is like limiting um, access to certain types of physical queer spaces, I think about uh, the lack of validation that folks might, might feel due to the lack of the ability to access those spaces. But I think what your research is really um, highlighting is that there are actually opportunities here as well. Uh, and so I think it's a matter of thinking through like, how can we optimize those opportunities for folks? I just wanted to say also to jump onto that, it, it was so beautiful to witness, you know, gender is, is obviously a very internal experience and this pandemic has provided us the opportunity to really go inward and, and not have to perform in an exter for external, you know, environments. And I really thought that that point was such a beautiful thing that was highlighted in your presentation. Thank you, Gavin. Any other questions for our wonderful panelists? Uh, so I'll just uh, add, as Manish mentioned, that we do have four posters in the poster exhibit from the Vancouver investigators as well, uh, with some really uh, interesting analyses uh, and some really important findings. 
um, I would really encourage you to take a look at those posters when you have a chance. Um, and otherwise, I just want to say thank you to all of our, uh, our wonderful investigators, presenters. Uh, I, I find this work so inspiring, uh, and I'm just so grateful that we have such amazing folks in our communities who are leading this work uh, from start to finish. So uh, yeah, thank you all. Thank you so much for this opportunity, and so lucky to be on this panel list of incredible people. Thank you. Yeah, this was a real treat, so thanks.